good morning friends we'll go for <coughs> sound or ut you can say ultrasonic testing part one sound modes this model illustrates the basic mode modes of sound ultrasonic testing uses high frequency sound sound energy to conduct examination and make measurements sound is produced by vibration or oscillation back and forth movement same like ball and spring pendulum rotating earth Displacement. Vibration is defined as the displacement of mass about its rest position. It is given by formula <clears throat> alpha equal to A sine alpha theta. Fi, sorry. So, as per that, you are, if you are putting all these things, you get this type of sine wave. Starting from 0 to maximum at 90, 0 at 180. Then max minimum at 270 and 0 at 360. Sound is produced by vibrating body and travels in the form of a wave. Sound waves travel through material by vibrating the particle that makes up the material. The pitch of sound is determined by the frequency of the wave vibration or cycles completed in a certain period of time. Ultrasound is sound with a pitch too high to be detected by human ear. So how much we can listen? So infrasonic or infrasound, we cannot listen. That is zero to 20 Hertz earthquake 20 to 20000 kilohertz that is audible to audible sound that is audible to human human hearing range speech music or etc greater than 20000 that is ultrasound bat and quartz crystal high frequency or low frequency generally at least as for as far as uh, we are concerned matter existing Three states, gas, liquid, and solid. It's not four. Okay, other states include plasma state, ionized state of matter, quark state, state where the proton and neutron decomposes to quark. So that is for nuclear physics. That is none of our business. Solid is high density, strong bonding forces, crystallographic structure, medium density. Medium bonding forces, low density, weak bonding forces, gas. So liquid is medium and medium. So that is okay. And then wave part, wave movement. So there is a crest, there is a trough, and there is a wave movement. But the wave is moving. But uh, if you see, the particles are not moving. That those are vibrating only. So this wave moving in the direction forward direction, introduction of waves. So there is wavelength, peaks and crest, and troughs and all. And there is a compression wave. There is a rarefication wave. There is a rarefication here. Basic principles of sound. The measurement of sound waves from test to crest determines the wavelength, that is lambda. Anyway, from zero to zero or crest to crest or Drop to drop or in between to in between. So all things are you can consider as lambda, but it is a standard length. Basic principles of sound, the wavelength is distance between the crest of two waves that are next to each other. The amplitude is very high. The crest uh, the wavelength is determined by the form following relationship. Wavelength is velocity by frequency. Velocity is meter per second. 
<coughs> frequency is cycles per second. So the number of cycles. So if you divide, you get the length of the cycle. This is the sound are traveling at about the same speed. The one with the shorter wavelength is go by more frequently. It is the higher frequency or pitch. In other words, the sound is higher, the size of wave, how much it is piled up at the high point, it is its amplitude for sound waves. The bigger the amplitude, the louder the sound. The time is taking a sound wave to travel distance of one complete wavelength is same amount of time it takes the source to execute one complete vibration. The sound wavelength is inversely proportional to its frequency. It is proportional, really not equal, V by F, that is. The velocity of longitudinal shear and surface waves are fixed uh, for a given material. The velocity of sound in each material is determined by material properties elastic modulus and density of that material. The velocity longitudinal is equal to Young's modulus divided, Young's modulus of elasticity divided by material density. Several wave modes vibrations are used in ultrasonic inspection. The most common are longitudinal shear and Rayleigh surface waves and plate lamp waves. Longitudinal waves are the waves in which the motion of particles in the medium is in same or opposite direction to the wave propagation. In longitudinal waves, the particles of the medium move back and forth, creating regions of high and low density or high or low pressure areas. It exists in a material, all material forms, that is solid, liquid, and air. Longitudinal waves, the animation shows a one-dimensional longitudinal plane wave propagating down a tube the particles do not move down the tube with the wave. They simply oscillate back and forth after their individual equilibrium positions. So, water waves are example of waves that involves combination of both longitudinal and transverse motions. As a wave travel through the wave, the particle travel in clockwise circles. Radius of circles decreases as the depth of water increases. So move the movie below shows water traveling from left to right. I'll leave it. So there is no movie here. Shear and transverse motion. Shear and transverse mo waves. A transverse wave, the particle displacement is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. The longitudinal it is parallel. You see, it is parallel. One dimensional longitudinal play wave propagating. So it is uh, parallel. Particle medium in the same proposed direction parallel to the back and forth parallel to the particle movement person. Here it is wave perpendicular to the wave propagation. And here it is circular. Elliptical, you can say. <coughs> so waves in a string are river or transverse waves. In the animation below shows a one-dimensional transverse plane wave propagating from left to right. Shear wave velocity for a given material is nearly 50% of its longitudinal velocity in that material. In that material. It exists only in Solid medium it cannot exist in gas and liquid medium. Raleigh's waves, surface waves. Uh, surface waves are the waves with both longitudinal and transverse motion found in solids. The particle in a solid through which the Raleigh surface wave passes move in the elliptical path. So with the major axis of the ellipse perpendicular to the surface of solid. As the depth into the solid increases, the width of the elliptical path in decreases. The Raleigh waves are different from water waves in one important way. In water waves, all the particles travel in clockwise circle. However, in Raleigh surface wave, particles at the surface trace out a counterclockwise ellipse. So that is the difference between these two. 
waterway when relay wave. So we are not dealing with much in the waterways. So we are dealing with relay waves. Well, particle at a depth is more than one fifth of the wavelength, tracks out clockwise helix. So it depends on the depth. So on the surface, it is counterclockwise ellipse. And one fifth of wavelength, it is a clockwise ellipse. Surface wave in a given material, uh, it is 0 0.9, 90% of the surface. Surface wave velocity. Relay waves are reflected from sharp corners, says or corners, but they continues to travel around smooth curvature and rounded things. So relay waves and surface waves like this. If a surface wave is introduced in a material that is thickness equal to three wavelengths or less of the beam, a different kind of wave result. Material begin to vibrate as a plate. The wave encompasses the entire thickness of the material. When this occurs, normal rules of wave velocity along the plate break down. The velocity is no longer depend on the type of material. In type of wave, instead we get a wave velocity that is depend on frequency of the wave, the angle of incidence, and of course the type of material. The two general type of flame plate waves depending on the way the particles of the material move as the wave moves along the plate. So symmetrical or asymmetrical. So each type of flame wave is an infinite number of modes that the wave may attain. These modes too are independent on the three factors of frequency of the wave, the angle of incidence, material. The modes are different by the way the particles in the material are moving. These are called plate waves and lamp waves. Ultrasonic reflection, particle motion in different two types, symmetrical, asymmetrical, and all. So these are symmetrical, these are asymmetrical. <coughs> Ultrasonic reflection from the presence of discontinuities or geometries which are enable detection and location. The velocity of sound in a given material is constant and can only be altered by change in mode of energy or change at part temperature. Temperature is also known a condition that affects the speed of sound. Heat like sound, it's a form of kinetic energy. Molecules at higher temperature have more energy, thus they can vibrate faster. Since the molecules vibrate faster, sound waves can travel more quickly. The speed of sound in the room temperature is 346 meters per second. The faster than 331 meter per second, which is speed of sound in air at freezing temperature. The formula to find speed of sound in air is follows. 331 plus 0.6 meter per second. <coughs> the same as 331, just uh, you can do. Or else root over 20. In the product, you can put uh, temperature plus 273. So these two formulas you can use. V is the speed of sound and T is the temperature of the air. So in centigrade, of course. One thing to keep in mind is that the formula finds the average speed of sound 
for every given temperature. The speed of sound is also affected by other factors such as humidity and air pressure. So what will happen if your temperature is higher? Then your sound will travel faster. Then what do you have? Think and go two minutes. Sound can be low at high sounds can be low. Low or high sound can be low like a growling tiger or high like a chipping bird. This characteristic of sound is called pitch or frequency. Objects which vibrate faster produce a higher frequency. The other objects which vibrate more slowly produce a lower frequency. The frequency of sound is equal to how many times it vibrates in each second. Vibrations per second are measured in hertz. The objects that vibrate one time each second has a frequency of one hertz. An object that vibrates five times each second has a frequency of five hertz. So megahertz means 10 to the power 6. So if it is 5 megahertz, it is 5 into 10 to the power 6 cycles per second. Imagine that you are floating on a surfboard and waves are going past you as each wave pass, you rise and fall. The frequency in each case is the number of times per second you bob up or down. Obviously, it will be less then one per second with ocean waves. So the frequency in this case will be less than one hertz. An object that vibrates one time each second would have a frequency of one hertz. Ultrasonic waves are very similar to light waves in that they can be reflected, refracted and focused. Sound requires a medium to vibrate. Where light don't need a medium. Because electromagnetic radiation is a combination of oscillating electric and magnetic field moving through a medium. Perpendicular to each other through space and carries energy from one place to another. Good up, huh? Hmm. Hi, Ruby. Ponir Ponir Ruti Ekaliki Haida Rati Jaki Kokila
So ultrasonic waves are very similar to light waves. In that they can be reflected, refracted and focused. Sound requires a medium to vibrate, to propagate. But light doesn't because electromagnetic radiation is a combination of oscillating electric and magnetic fields moving through a medium perpendicular to each other through space and carries energy from one place to another. Reflection and refraction occurs when sound waves interact with interfaces of differ differing acoustic properties in solid material. The vibration and energy can be split into different waves, modes, when the wave encounters an interface at an angle other than 90 degrees. The angle of reflection and refraction are governed by Snell's law. Both reflection and refraction are governed by Snell's law, so it holds true for both longitudinal and shear waves. Snell's law is sine I, sine incident by sine refraction equal to B of incidence angle and B of refracted medium. So reflection angle of reflection is equal to incident angle. So that is here. If we to sit down. <laughs> So reflection and I equal to or angle of reflection equal to angle of incidence. So that is you can say R1 instead of R. So refraction angle of refraction is a function of incident angle and velocity ratio between incident and refractive mediums. So when a longitudinal wave is reflected inside the material, the reflected shear wave is reflected at a smaller angle than the reflected longitudinal wave. This is due to the fact that shear velocity is less than the longitudinal velocity within a given material. Refraction is bending of waves when they enter a medium where their speed is different. Refraction is an important phenomenon. With an ultrasound, this property is used to generate shear wave in second medium. Another visualization of refraction can come from steering of various types of tractors, construction equipment, tanks, and other tracted vehicle. If you apply the right brake, the vehicle turns right because you have slowed down one side of the vehicle without slowing down the other. So refraction takes place at interface due to different velocities of the acoustic wave within the two material. When the longitudinal wave is refracted into a material, the refracted shear wave angle is smaller than the refracted longitudinal wave. This is due to the fact that the shear velocity is less than longitudinal velocity within a given material. Please remember that the sum of the wave energy is always reflected at the interface. When a sound travels in a solid material, one form of energy can be transformed into another form. For example, when longitudinal waves heat at interface at an angle, some of the energy can cause particular movement in transverse direction to the start of shear wave. Mode conversion occurs when a wave encounters an interface between material, different acoustic impedance. The incident angle is not normal to the interface. If it is normal, there is nothing. Only longitudinal, longitudinal. It, there is no mode conversion. 
Mode conversion can occur in both reflective and refractive mediums. Both mode conversion occurs every time a wave encountered interface at an angle. Ultrasonic signals, signals can become confusing at times. When a wave encounters reflector within a medium, one of which following occurs. Diffraction occurs when the sound wavelength is larger than the reflector size. This condition prevails at the age of the discontinuity. Lambda, the reflector size. Stuttering occurs when the sound of a wavelength about the same size of reflector. So reflector occurs when the sound wavelength is smaller than reflection only occurs. Cutter occurs when it is same size. Diffraction occurs when it is larger than the reflector size. Diffraction, the bending of wave around a small obstacle and the spreading out of waves beyond small openings, small compared to the wavelength. When a web encounters a point reflector small in comparison to a wavelength, the reflected wave is re-radiated as a spherical wave front. When a plane wave encounters the edges of reflective interface, such as near the tip of fatigue cracks, specular mirror-like reflections occur along the flat surface of the crack and cylindrical waves, wavelets are launched from the edges. This redirection into path of subsequent advancing plane waves result in incident and reflected scattered waves interfering, forming regions of reinforcement, constructive interference, and cancellation, destructive inter interference. So either constructive or destructive, a plane wave in one of which quantities vary only with the distance along a certain direction and with time. <clears throat> that is the sound wave, the sound source, diffraction around a post, and diffraction past small opening. So suppose you bought a concert ticket without looking at sitting chart, and wound up sitting behind a large post, you'd be able to hear the current sunset quite well because the wavelength of sound are long enough to bend around the post. If you are outside an open door, you could still hear because the sound would spread out from the small opening as if it is it were a localized source of sound. If you are well several wavelengths of sound past the post, you would not be able to detect the presence of the post from the nature of the sound. Important parts of our experience with sound involve diffraction. The part that you can hear sound around the corners, around barriers involve both diffraction and reflection of sound. Diffraction is in such cases helps the sound to bend around the obstacle. The fact that diffraction is more pronounced with longer wavelengths implies that you can hear low frequencies around obstacle better than high frequencies as illustrated by the example of marching band on the street. Another common example of diffraction is contrast in the sound from a close lightning strike and a distance one. Thunders from a close bolt of lightning will be experienced as a sharp crack, indicating the presence of a lot of high frequency sound that thunder from a distance strike will be experienced as a low rumble since it is long wavelengths which can bend around obstacles to get to you. There are other factors such as high air, air absorption or high frequencies involved, but diffraction plays a part in the experience. So there is an incident angle at uh, which the angle of refraction of the longitudinal wave is 90 degrees parallel to the surface. This is called first critical angle. The incident angle at which the angle of refraction for the shear wave is 90 degrees because shear wave is first. And then comes the longitudinal wave. So at this point, all the wave energy is reflected or refracted into the surface following shear wave or shear creep wave. Slightly beyond the second critical angle, surface waves will generate. At the first critical angle incident, uh, much of the acoustic energy 
is in the form of an inhomogeneous compression wave. This travels along the interface and decays exponentially with depth from the center face. This wave is sometimes referred to as creep wave. They are similar to water waves. Because of their inhomogeneous nature and the fact that they can decay rapidly, the creep waves are not used as extensively by as relay surface waves in entity. However, creep waves are sometimes useful because they suffer less from surface irregularities and coarse material microstructure due to their longer wavelengths than relay waves. Away from their source due to then geometrical spreading, scattering, and absorption. Loss of energy due to absorption and scattering is known as attenuation. It is measured in dB per meter or dB per millimeter. This loss of proportional to the grain volume in the material and inversely proportional to the wavelength of the beam. So it is also expressed in nippers per unit length. <laughs> The 1 dB per centimeter or 8.686 nipper per centimeter. So these are fine grain steel and coarse grain steel. These are two types of grain structure. Gray iron, spherical graphite tire. A decaying plane wave is expressed as A equal to A0 e to the power alpha T or alpha J. Alpha T, you can say. In this expression, A0 is the amplitude of propagating wave at some location. The amplitude is the reduced amplitude after the wave has traveled a distance Z. From that initial location, the quantity is the attenuation coefficient of the wave traveling in the Z direction. The dimensions in the nippers for length, where an nipper is a dimension. Dimensionless quantity and hyper constant, which is equal to approximately 2.71828. The units of attenuation value nippers per length can be converted to decibels length by dividing by 0.1151 decibels is a more common unit when relating the amplitudes of two signals. Attenuation is generally proportional to the square of sound frequency. Quoted values of attenuation are often given for a single frequency or attenuation value averaged over many frequencies may be given. Also, the actual value of attenuation coefficient for a given material is highly dependent on the way it, in which the material uh, was manufactured. The quoted values of attenuation only give a rough indication of the attenuation and should not be automatically trusted. Generally, a reliable method value of attenuation can only be obtained by determining the attenuation experimentally for the particular material being used. Generally defined loss of amplitude over the distance traveled in total transit time, 2T. In pulse echo testing, there are many factors in which account for the amplitude loss. The amplitude loss due to beam divergence has to be taken into account when calculating attenuation in the far zone. Amplitude difference, beam spread, minus attenuation. Generally, in the far zone, doubling the distance reduces the back echo by half 6 dB due to beam spread. Attenuation in the far zone. Near field is less than thickness and near field is. Attenuation in the near field and near field is greater than thickness. dB difference uh, minus 6 by 2 T, dB per meter, dB attenuation in the near field when near field is greater than thickness. Attenuation can be determined by evaluating the multiple back wall reflections in, in a typical scan display like uh, one shown in the image. The number of decibels between two adjacent signals is measure, measured and this value is divided by time interval or distance between them. The calculation produces attenuation coefficient in the decibels for unit time, ut or dB per unit distance. This value can be converted to nippers per length by the following equation. 0 0.1151 ut by b that is not required for you. 
leave it inverse square law that means say equal to 4 pi square and intensity of spherical sound waves decays as 1 by r square so there is scattering and there is absorption scattering is more difficult problem than absorption of course and the ultrasonic beam encounters more randomly oriented reflectors in the material microscopic reflection direction other than original direction of propagation is called scattering scattering can make the trace unreadable and cause discontinuities to be missed the presence of small amount of grass at the base of trace is generally an indication that sound energy is occupied coupled to the test object once the grass in exceeds 10% full screen height however it is known as material noise and makes discrimination difficult between the natural scattering and discontinuities normally you need to have a signal to noise ratio at high as high as possible at least 3 is to 1 for reliable detection 3 is to 1 you have to have sn ratio absorption the conversion of sound to other forms of energy absorption of sound to heat energy even physically converted to heat within the material energy is taken from beam so so of course the returning signal have less energy the appears smaller in your disc screen this can generally be overcome by increasing the amplification to compensate for the losses as the frequency is lowered and the wavelength becomes greater than the grain size attenuation is due only damping of the wave the damping losses wave energy is lost through the heat due to friction of the vibrating particle absorption is used to advantage in medical ultrasonic therapy which intentionally produce produces considerable amount of heat in human tissue to aid in recovery from injury there are different uh, materials different attenuation so if you have more attenuation you have you should have rather go for low frequency increasing amplification may help to overcome absorption yeah. so the material is difficult to test proper attenuation to the attenuation characteristics can result in a valid test the first reaction dealing with attenuation material is generally to increase the gain amplification of the instrument to compensate for the energy loss this will compensate for basic absorption but will not help when faced with such scattering lower frequencies also act as to reduce absorption effects increasing amplification doesn't help with scatter with scattering much of the scattered beam will send back to the receiver and will be detected giving rise to an apparently random set of indication often referred to as grass if excessive amplification is used the grass becomes excessive and the screen display becomes unmanageable a similar effect occurs when diving in fog putting headlights on the high beam results in diver being dazzled by the reflection from the fog dipole droplets and doesn't improve visibility frequency selection in, uh, will increase tolerance of scattering as attenuation is greater at short wavelength high frequencies high attenuation material can usually examine using low frequencies typically 1 to 2 megahertz some experimentation may be required to find optimum frequency by progressively decreasing the frequency until the usable frequency is found to continue our analogy of diving in fog using lower frequency like using fog lights that operate with lower optical frequency that is a color closer to the red end of the visible spectrum <clears throat> so 
So this depend on the fine grain or high grain, coarse grain structure. You can <coughs> use what type of frequency. There is a typical uh, given, typical data given. The typical ranges in practical practice, maximum range will depend on probe design, equipment, pulse strength, probe diameter, and specific material grain structure. For shear waves, which uh, have approximately half the wavelength, the maximum shear wave ranges are approximately equal to the compensation. Compression wave of twice the frequency in the table. table for example, 2 megahertz here is a similar test range of 4 megahertz compression. The improved penetration at low frequencies is obtained at the expense of reduced sensitivity to smaller discontinuity. <coughs> Increased pulse energy can sometimes help when testing longer ranges. Some instruments are able to produce longer duration pulse to put more energy into the test piece. This facility may be useful in dealing with materials moderate and tenuous but suffers from similar response to excess amplification. Increased pulse energy also results in loss of resolution. The higher the attenuation of material, the lower the maximum thickness that can be reliably examined. Sound travels through material under the influence of sound pressure because of the molecules of atom of a solid are bound elastically to one another, the excess pressure result in the wave propagating through the solid. The acoustic impedance Z of a material is defined as the product of density and acoustic velocity. <coughs> rho V, Z equal to rho into V, not P, when read rho. Acoustic impedance is the amount, it is important in determination of acoustic transmission and reflection at the boundary of the two materials having different acoustic impedance. The design of ultrasonic transducer assessing absorption of sound in a medium. The reflected energy from terms of pressure amplitude is the difference divided by some of the acoustic impedance of the two materials. Z2 minus Z1 by Z2 minus plus Z1. That is per pressure amplitude this things. Amplitude, the intensity reflection, only reflected energy. So 1 minus <coughs> one order transmission energy, reflected energy 1. And intensity of reflection, only reflected energy in terms of intensity of power. Square of difference divided by sum of acoustic impedances. The two material. So Z2 minus Z1 whole square divided by Z2 minus Z1 whole square. So this is the formula, not the above one. The above one in they are confusing. So So this is the formula, 1 minus R equal to T. You can put that. Don't look at those things. These are the right things, but uh, they put in terms of pressure, in terms of, you may be confused. Don't just go for this. Amplitude equal to intensity of reflection, only reflected energy in terms of this. Square of the difference divided by some of the acoustic impedances. Ultrasonic waves are reflected in boundaries where there are difference in acoustic impedance. So this is commonly referred to an impedance mismatch. The fraction of the incident wave intensity of the reflected waves can be derived because of particle velocity and local particle pressures are required to be continuous according to across the boundary between the materials. Formulation of acoustic reflection and transmission coefficients pressure are shown in the Interactive figure below, different uh, materials may be selected or you may alter the material velocity or density to change the acoustic impedance of one or both materials. The red arrow represents the reflected sound where the blue arrow 
represent the transmission sound. Leave it. So we don't have that. You can see inside the NDT resource center. The reflected energy in terms of pressure amplitude is given by T equal to 1, one by R. <coughs> Same, they put in pressure, amplitude, and then they put intensity and amplitude. So bottom one, you can see T equal to 1 minus R equal to 4 Z2, Z1 divided by Z2 plus Z1 whole square. So either of the formula you can use. So this is the formula downside. Don't look at that. If you are confused, just look at this. And this one you can use. This is for reflective. Uh, this is about transmission. That is for reflection. When R is the positive and there is no phase reversal to place after reflection. When a sound wave approaches a soft boundary, the soft boundary permits it to move upward. The net vertical pose at the free end is zero. The reflected wave pulse propagates from right to left with the same speed and amplitude at the incident wave and with the same polarity right side up. The free sub-boundary, the restoring pose, is zero and the reflected wave has the <coughs> same polarity. No phase change as the incident wave. So from high speed to low speed, low density to high density, low speed to high speed. Note that the energy reflected from the water to steel interface is 0.88. So 12% is transmitted into the component. So from this 12% transmitted into water, the final interface would allow only 12% of 10.58. So at the second interface, back surface, you have 10.56. 12% transmitted to the water. So remaining 12%, 1.26% of the ori original energy to be transmitted back to the transducer. Even that is if they consider for the, believe it, 1.26% is coming back for the transducer. Variation of acoustic pressure with angle reflection and refraction during the immersion ultrasonic inspection of aluminium. Leave it. So attenuation occurs by absorption and scattering. Absorption can often be managed. <coughs> Use of lower frequency. Scattering is managed by using lower frequencies and minimizing the beam path length where possible. The decibel notation is a convenient way of measuring and comparing eco amplitude over a very wide range. Attenuation properties may be expressed as a attenuation coefficient, dB per mm, and that are influenced by metallurgical condition, homogeneity, and probe frequency. Some purging you can test or is a constructive interaction, destructive interaction, and differential interaction. So phase related to vibration onto time when two vibrations are in phase, you have constructive phase. Both waves are augment to each other or reverse to each other, the resultant wave is more in amplitude. When the two vibrations are in opposite phase, peak valley, they cancel each other. The unit of sound is bell, which is much bigger quantity for normal use. Therefore, we use smaller unit called decibel. Ultrasonic, the attenuation characteristic of given material are expressed in terms of attenuation coefficient, which has units of decibels per meter or decibel per millimeter. So we need to understand decibel notation. If you are not familiar with logarithms, now 
would be a good time to learn about them. The most immediately obvious means of measuring the relative pressure of the sound wave is through its echo amplitude. If one echo has amplitude of 100% full screen height and another has amplitude 50% full screen height and the fact full screen height, the first can be said to have twice the acoustic pressure of the second. In ultrasonic, we need to work over a very large range of amplitudes, which is, it is easy to compare large screen heights. It is difficult to compare small screen heights. If we want to compare 10% echo with a 5% echo, then here, readability of the screen makes it impossible to make the accurate comparison. It is 4%, 5%, 6%, how you measure. The inaccuracy of such comparison is too large. To improve the usable range, most UFDs are equipped with a calibration gain control, sometimes called an attenuator in the US, to allow more accurate comparison. The gain compares its calibration. To improve the usable range, most UFDs are equipped with calibration gain control and sometimes called attenuator. The gain control is calibrated in decibels. The bell is a unit of comparing power to two, sig of two signals by measuring their ratio. That is one bell is log of W1 by W2. They have powers of W1 and W2. So if powers are going for pressure, the ultrasonic we have concern with measurement of sound pressure, not power. So we need to expression of decibels in terms of pressure P1 by P2 or 20 log P1 by P2. So it is two can go for the 10 and then 20 log. So to determine dB equivalent measure each amplitude or the ratio, take the log, then multiply by 20. So that is A1 by A2. Large variation in amplitude can easily be measured accurately using a calibrated gain control. If, for instance, you want to accurately compare a very strong 100% FSH and very weak 1% signal, you can similarly adjust. So you can simply adjust the calibration, calibrated gain for each signal so that signal reaches the same screen height and measure the gain difference to give an accurate comparison. So different ratios, 10, 2, and all this. So log. So 20 log A1 by A2, you find 20. So 50% or 10% is 20 TB. 50% 6dB, 25% is 12dB, so that is 4%, 2% is half, one fourth, like that. This ratio is 4. Ratio 2, you have 6dB, ratio 4, you have 12dB, ratio 2, 6dB, 6dB. The dB values for any signal is not an absolute measurement. It is always relative to some other reference. The response from a back wall or drill hole. The 20 dB signal is one that 10 times another and is commonly used value in ultrasonics. The 6 dB signal is one that is twice another and is also commonly used in ultrasonics. Many UFD units have core steps of 20 dB intervals, which correspond to radius ratios 10 is to 1 between core squares. Intervals which correspond to ratio 1.25 is to 1 between steps. Large variation in amplitude can be easily measured accurately using calibration gain control with it. Now the use of dB common in many other applications, we often see the silencer and noise equipment being given a noise 
reduction rating. For instance, it has rating of 40 dB. The noise power reduced is 100 fold. If the rating is 80 dB, the noise reduction is 10,000 fold. If the noise reduction rating of a composer, compressor is 80 dB. Therefore, an extra 6 dB is needed. And you want to double the noise reduction to 20,000 to 1. How many additional decibels are noise reduction would have need? The decibel value of a signal is positive if greater than the reference and negative if less than reference. The amplitude in question greater than that of reference, it is said to have a positive gain relative to the reference. The amplitude is less than the reference, it is said to have a negative gain. If you have a reference signal at 50% and unknown signal at 100%, the unknown signal is said to have positive gain of 6. If you have a reference gain of 50 and unknown signal of 25, the unknown signal is said to have a negative gain of 6 dB or attenuation of 6 dB. Establish an echo from a convenient back wall and adjust the gain such that the signal is 100% related. So quick decibel calculations, it is possible to calculate the dB value. You know that 6 dB represents a ratio of 2 is to 1, 20 dB represents 10 is to 1. The trick is to realize that the addition of decibel values corresponding to a multiplication of ratios and subtraction of decibel values correspond to the division or of ratios. For example, the determine the ratio equivalent to 12%, dB, 12 dB. We note that 12, 6 plus 6 changing the ratio 6 dB value becomes 2. The additional become multiplication. We therefore have ratio equivalent to two times two. That is four. Still, dB means ratio of four is to one. A quadrupling with the res with respect to some reference values. So here is another example where we find fourteen dB, twenty dB minus six dB. That is five. Most analogy of the units have a fine step grain control and most digital instruments read gain much greater than precision. So fine stepped unit. It is important to make attenuation measurement in the far zone. We'll talk about near and far zones in the next talks. The knee, in the near zone, ultrasonic response is erratic and it is not possible to make reliable comparison. In the far zone, the ultrasonic response is predictable and sound pressure can be predicted more accurately. So calculate the appropriate near zone length n of the probe by appearing the form, applying the formula n equal to d square by 4 lambda or d square f by 4 b, because lambda equal to b by f. Using either an immersion or contact setup, display two or more back wall reflection on a parallel sided sample of the material as shown. Use back walls beyond three near zone lengths, unless this is impossible due to the material characteristics. Display of display the first back wall at 
100% screen height, note that extra gain required to bring the next back wall 100% screen height. Record this extra gain. Effort, we just go do an example to understand. For a 10 millimeter by 2 megahertz zero longitudinal probe, calculate the near zone. So lambda equal to V by F, 5.9 into 10 to the power 6 divided by 2 into 10 to the power 6. You can directly do it, that is 2.95 millimeter. This is lambda, and D square is 10 square, because all in mm divided by four into velocity a four lambda that is two point nine five called eight point five mm so near zone is eight point five mm for a twenty five mm thick set object first back wall is approximately three near zones Use back walls beyond three near zone lengths unless this is impossible due to material characteristics. The first back wall is at 100% FHI, gain is adjusted. Bring the second back wall 100%. Let us adjust by 2 dB reference and gain. Distance between back wall 25 milli, attenuation coefficient. 0.04 dB per millimeter, 40 dB per meter. Measure the attenuation of your V1 block for this. Application of attenuation measurement. Measurement can tell whether material can reasonably be examined. If the material is excessive attenuation, it may not be possible to effectively examine it, particularly particularly in thick sections, some standard place limits on the attenuation characteristics of the material. And if the attenuation is too high, it may be necessary to carry out corrective heat treatment <coughs> or to place qualifications on the result of the examination. Attenuation measurements can check heat treatment process. Attenuation increases with increasing metallurgical grain size, excessive grain, Excessive grain size is often an undesirable property and may be uneven throughout the section. Relative attenuation measurements are quite simple and quick to make and can be used to check that heat treatment has been effective. Attenuation can also be used to discriminate between SG iron and gray iron casting. Resistance spot welding testing using attenuation to evaluate weld quality. There are thousands of spot welds in the thin metal sits in the average of more motor vehicles. These were traditionally tested by measuring the force required to pull apart a test weld. This is not a very scientific test. It has recently been challenged by ultrasonic method that can determine much.
So the formula for calculating acoustic impedance is very simple. Z equal to rho into velocity or rho C you are taking. <coughs> Calculate the acoustic impedance of the steel. Just you can find. You can calculate rho B and the so forty five point four into ten to the power six this is not hundred six. The ten to the power six and all. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't know. In words, we can do here. We have to find out from here. Okay, this is 10 to the power 6. Leave it. <coughs> I'll not say all these things. So we have two formulas. So either you can use by this method, but you will get slight different things here, I think. So. You can take this formula for, uh, is good. Calculate the energy reflection and transmission coefficient of a sound traveling from seal to water. You will find reflection is 87% and transmission is 12 percent already you had done so comparing the pressure and energy conversion energy transmission is like measuring power across the transformer and will always give positive reflection coefficient you will mainly use the pressure conversion as they relate to motor screen height as a measure of acoustic pressure coupleant Ideal coupleant has a particular property. It wets the surface of the probe. It is non-toxic, non-corrosive, can be applied, removed easily, has an acoustic impedance somewhere between the probe and the test object, although it is not generally possible. It is homogeneous and free of bubbles that uh, would scatter the beam. It is sufficiently viscous to prevent flow of test surface, allow easy movement over the test surface. So water is the cheapest and most abundant coupleant, but may need detergents added to wet the surface or methyls. Cellulose act like a thickening agent to retain the surface. May also be necessary to add rust inhibitors when water is used. Oil and greases are used where water is insoluble. Insuitable, they also stay in the surface longer and do not evaporate as quickly from the warmer surface. Glycerin is the most favorable liquid for acoustic impedance properties and may be mixed with water if required. Mercury is the theoretically a very good coupleant due to its high acoustic impedance, but is neither practical or not safe for use. So interface is a boundary at which there is a change of acoustic impedance. Now that is we do to 
sound is meeting an interface at right angles so it will be partly transmitted across the interface partly reflected by it the greater the difference in acoustic impedance values of the two media the greater the amount of reflection and lesser the amount of transmission and vice versa So U of D is made up of six basic elements, timer, pulse generator, probe, sweep generator, amplifier, CR or digital display. The timer signals the pulse generator, that is the time to send pulse. And the time also signals the sweep generator, that is pulse is being sent. And the pulse generator sends a spike to transducer. <laughs> around 300 volt which converts the spike to a mechanical sound wave that commences the journey from the transducer at the same time the sweep generator sends an electron beam on its journey across the CRO or digital display CRT you can say cathode ray tube The electron beam lifts the left side of the CRO at the same instant that sound wave lifts the transducer, the UFD and the probe. Wait while the sound pulse travels through the material and reflected back. Returning to the probe, the returning sound wave reaches the transducer, which immediately reconverts to an electrical signal in millivolt range. The weak electrical signal from the transducer is received <laughs> by the amplifier and amplified in accordance with the gain applied. Other processing such as rectification may also be applied at this stage. The amplified and processed signal is applied to the top and bottom blades of CRO. By which time the electron beam is traveled some distance across the screen. At that point, the image of the received sound wave is displayed on the truss indicating the amplitude space and transmit transit time note that transit time is the time taken to do the round trip of the reflector to the reflector the cycle from steps one to five is occurring at a rate of around 500 times per second 500 hertz this cycle rate is called the pulse repetition frequency <laughs> ER, R, ER, F, you can say, PR, pulse frequency, repetition frequency. Many modern UFDs are now digital and analog CRO screen has been replaced by a digital display. The computer screen, the digital display allows much greater flexibility recording the trace but losses of the real time speed of analog CRO. So before all these things are there, now it is controlled by <coughs> There are switch controls before, and you can see somewhere also these type of things. The range is expanded or contracted by varying the rate at which the sweep generator moves the electron beam across the screen. So these are needed to calibration and all things. How you calibrate, we'll see. The zero control allows synchronization of material to zero, to the material zero. Zero or delay control. The gain control determines the amount of application amplification applied to the screen display, dB. So 
suppress and reject to suppress and reject anything any grass and all but we are taking it zero you know putting suppression control <clears throat> Before it is there, uh, now also it is there, but in different way. The single twin switch selected type probe to be used. Pulse repetition frequency PRF can be adjusted in some UFTs. PRF controls the rate at which the pulse are generated. If the pulse repetition frequency is too low, there are two few strips across the screen and the trace is very faint. A high pulse repetition frequency is also needed when testing at higher speeds or these are a risk that the volume of material will not be fully scanned. If the PRF is too high, a situation can arise where one pulse is not fully died away before the next pulse is transmitted. The oscilloscope doesn't know which reflected pulse relate to which transmitted pulse. The random ghost echoes can appear. Drop pulse that uh, received by amplifier is an unrectified sine wave. Unless it is important to have an unrectified trace, more traces are rectified for easy ease of interpretation. There is also some smoothing applied to trace to make easier interpretation. Monitors gates can be selected at section at the trace of special atten attention. The principal advantages are the user can program setting or later used to give greater reproducibility. The ability to store settings as test record, digital oscilloscopes. The stresses can be saved for subsequent processing and review. The test can be rerun off-site with changed settings. <clears throat> digital displays have made reading beam path much simpler. Reading the distance on the screen is relatively simple with most digital equipment. There are generally larger choice of options for calibration and the screen is directly marked with easily readable read. Analog displays needed throughout in the selecting the range. So you decide that the ideal range of testing would be 0 to 250 millimeter and calibrated accordingly. The range is calibrated in 10 major divisions, each of which five minor divisions. What does each major division now represent? A 25 millimeter. <clears throat> so what does each minor division represent? So you get an indication at the seventh major division, what is the distance? Data presentation, scan presentation, scan presentation display the amount of received ultrasound energy as a function of time. The relative amount of received energy is plotted along vertical axis in elapsed time. Most instruments with a scan display allows the signal to display in its natural radio frequency RF as a fully rectified RF signal or as either positive or negative half of the RF signal in the ASCAN presentation relative 
discontinuity size can be estimated by comparing the signal amplitude obtained from an unknown reflector to that of known reflector. So these are a scan. <coughs> so this is B scan. Then this is C scan. The top view. B e scan is this one. When the transducer is overflow, B signal B will appear at a point on the time scale that is approximately halfway between IP signal and the B the wave call signal. Since the IP signal correspond to that is initial pulse signal corresponding to front surface of the material, this indicates that flow B is about halfway between front and back, blah blah blah. And when the transducer is moved over. Flow C signal C will appear earlier in time. Since the sound travel path is shorter and the signal B will disappear. Since sound will no longer be reflecting from it. And Syscan presentation provides the plan type of view or top view. The plane of image is parallel to the scan pattern of the transducer. Syscan represents uh, presentation are produced with an automated data acquisition system such as a computer control immersion scanning system. Typically, a data collection gate is established in the scan and amplitude or the time of flight. The signal is recorded at regular intervals. The transducer is scanned over the test piece. The relative signal amplitude or time of flight is displayed as a set of gray or a color for each of the position where data was recorded. The C-scan presentation provides an image of the fissures that reflect the scatter, the sound within and on the surface of the test piece of light. So pulse receivers, ultrasonic pulse receivers are well suited to general purpose ultrasonic testing along with appropriate transducers and an oscilloscope. They can be used for flaw detection and thickness gauging in a wide variety of metals, plastic, ceramics, composites, ultrasonic pulsar receiver produce a unique low-cost ultrasonic measurement capability. The pulse section of the instrument generates short or large amplitude electric pulse or control energy which are converted into salt Sort ultrasonic pulse when applied to an ultrasonic transducer. Most, most pulsar sections have very low impedance output. Better drive transducers control function associated with pulsar circuit include pulse strength or damping, the amount of time the pulse is applied to transducer, pulse energy, the voltage applied to the transducer. Typical pulsar circuit will apply 100 volts to 800 volts to a transducer. <coughs> In the receiver section, the voltage signal produced by the transducer, which represents the received ultrasonic pulse are amplified. The amplified radio frequency signal is available as output for display or cap capture for signal processing. Signal rectification, the RF signal can be viewed as a positive half wave, negative half wave or full wave. Filtering to shape and smooth return signals, gain or signal amplification, reject control. Tone bus generator. <clears throat> Leave it. So we have probes. So you have socket crystal. A damping, delay, protecting phase, electrical matching cable. So these are normal probes. Single crystal, double crystal, twin probes. And then this is 
angle props you have learned about how ultrasonic waves travel through the material we will now consider how ultrasonic waves are generated and received generators and receivers of ultrasonic waves are called probes ultrasonic transducers are manufactured uses transducers manufacture a variety of applications and can be custom fabricated when necessary careful attention attention can be paid selecting a proper transducer for the application um, application it is important to choose transducers that have a desired frequency bandwidth and focus to optimize inspection capability most often the transducer is chosen either to enhance the sensitivity or resolution of the system there are variety of piezoelectric materials with different properties the three most common piezoelectric materials used in ultrasonic transducer are quartz lithium sulfate polarized ceramics the most common ceramics present are barium titanate lead metal lead metal niobate niobate and lead zirconate titanate measuring the stress in mechanical system medically to measure the pressure in the part of body the fishing depth of sounding to measure the depth and locate fish in greeting cards they play the tune okay the phenomenon is uh, when the electric field is applied across a material the polarized molecules will align themselves with electric field resulting in, in induced dipoles within the molecular or crystal structure of the material this alignment of molecules will cause this material to change dimension this phenomenon is known as electrostriction these are all powder metallurgy substances powder and pressed in high temperature with high voltage so they are aligned themselves with the electric field result and compressed and become one crystal so this phenomenon is known as electrostriction or addition of permanently polarized materials such as quartz by uh, barium titanate will produce an electric field when the material changes dimension because of imposed mechanical force this phenomenon is known as piezoelectric effect prefix piezo is derived from deep part meaning to press So elongating or compression, it is producing sound wave or electricity, vice versa. The active element of most acoustic transducer used today is piezoelectric ceramics, which can be cut in various ways to produce different wave modes. A large piezoelectric ceramic element can be seen in the image with this section. low frequency transducer proceeding the advent of piezoelectric ceramic batio3 in early 1950s piezoelectric crystal made from quartz crystal and magnetostric restrictive material were primarily used the active element is sometimes still sometimes referred to as the crystal by old timer in the nit field when piezoelectric ceramics were introduced they soon become dominant material for transducers due to their good piezoelectric properties and the ease of manufacture into variety of shapes and sizes the piezo polarized ceramic transducers are most efficient generators of ultrasonic energy they operate well at low voltage are practically unaffected by moisture and are usable up to 300 degrees centigrade 
they are limited by relatively low mechanical strength some old conversion interface and tend to age the first piezoelectric ceramic piezo ceramic in general used is barium titanate and that was followed during 1960 by zirconate titanate composition and most commonly employed ceramic for making transducer pjt has optimum combination of con conversion from electrical to mechanical back to electrical needed for ultrasonic these are the number of different materials and then the pjt group new materials such as pjo polymers and composites are also being used in some applications So quartz is the first used is naturally occurring and well known transducer called quartz crystal. Quartz crystals are cut into x or y planes to produce longitudinal and shear waves respective. So for x crystal you have longitudinal wave and from y quartz crystal you have shear wave. X quartz is for cut in the xy plane and y cut is the z y cut is the z y plane cut In the past, quartz transducer have used most exclusively, but the development of new material that is used less and less. Quartz has excellent chemical, electrical, thermal stability. It is insoluble in most liquids and is very hard and very resistant. Quartz also has a good uniformity and resist edging. Unfortunately, it is least efficient generator of acoustic energy of the commonly used materials. It also suffers from more conversion interference and requires high voltage to drive it to low frequencies. Lithium sulfate is another material used in the construction of transducer. It is a natural piezoelectric material. Lithium sulfate transducers are most efficient receivers of ultrasonic energy and the intermediate is a generator of ultrasonic energy. They do not age and are affected by a little by mode conversion interference. Lithium sulfate is very fragile, soluble in water and limited to use at temperature below 165 degrees Fahrenheit. The thickness of the active element is determined by desired frequency of the transducer. The thin buffer element vibrates with wavelength that is twice its thickness. Therefore, the piezoelectric crystal is got to thickness that is half of the desired radiated wavelength. The higher the frequency of the transducer, the thinner the active element. The primary reason is that the high frequency contact transducers are not produced in because the element is very thin and too fragile. So fundamental frequency f equal to v by 2t. Velocity divided by 2 thickness. So thickness can calculate V by 2, 2 F. So frequency high, the thickness is less. The conversion of electrical pulse to mechanical vibration and the conversion of return mechanical vibration back to electrical energy is the basis of ultrasonic testing. The transducer Transinducer in the Latin meaning to lead across the device that converts one form of energy into another. Audio microphones and speakers are typical transducer. The microphone takes mechanical vibration, converts into electrical signal. The speaker takes the electrical signal from the audio system and converts back to audible signal. The active element is a piece of polarized material 
some part of this molecule are positively charged whether other parts of the molecule are negatively charged with electrodes attached to two of its opposite faces. The conversion of electrical pulses to mechanical vibration and the conversion of written mechanical vibration into electrical energy is the basis of ultrasonic testing. So audio microphones and speakers are typical transducers. When a piezoelectric element is subjected to an electrical voltage, it will expand. The voltage polarity is reversed, it is contract. Then if they are exposed in an alternative voltage, they will oscillate in the frequency of that voltage. This allows an electrical signal to the converted the mechanical signal. As in an audio speaker, the piezoelectric effect is reversible, meaning that the transducer will also take a mechanical signal and convert it back to an electrical signal as in audio microphone. <coughs> the transducer is a very important part of ultrasonic instrumentation system. <coughs> the transducer incorporates epigeoelectric elements which converts electrical signal into, mecha into mechanical vibration. So there is it include sorry. Radiation surface area, mechanical damping, housing, connector type, and other variables of physical construction. Transducer manufacturers are hard pressed uh, when the construction to transducer that have identical performance characteristics. So there is a case, epoxy non baking material, electrodes, piezoelectric element, coaxial cable connector, signal wire, ground wire, and wire plate. <coughs> So to get much energy out of the transducer as possible, an impedance matching is placed between the active element and the face of the transducer. Optimal impedance matching is achieved by sizing the matching layer so that the thickness of one fourth web length. This gives waves that were reflected within the matching layer in phase and the exit the layer as illustrated in the figure. <coughs> For contact transducers, the matching layer is made from material that has an acoustical impedance between the active element and steel. Immersion transducers have matching layer uh, with an acoustical impedance between active element and water. Contact transducer often incorporated wire plate to protect the matching layer and active element from scratch. The baking material supporting the crystal has a great influence on the damping characteristic of the transducer using a baking material with an impedance similar to that of active element will produce the most effective damp damping. So baking material impedance similar to that of active element, most effective damping. Such a transducer will have an narrow bandwidth resulting in higher sensitivity. As the mismatch, the impedance between the active element and the baking material increase, the material penetra penetration increases for transducer sensitivity is reduced. Mm. Have a broad bandwidth, narrow bandwidth, you know. <coughs>
So there are other ways to generate direct ultrasonic waves, EMETs, electromagnetic acoustic transducer. The utilization of recurrent principle, they are particularly useful for generating lab, lamp waves in thin materials by, by using an electromagnetic coupling as opposed to conventional liquid coupling. They are well suited to testing moving and hot and or hot objects. EMET is also possible. Electromagnetic acoustic transducer by magnetic magnetism we are producing this. <clears throat> and a coil is placed around a theoretic substance, it will vibrate. So that's vibration you can use as a emit and you can have same effect as UT. We are doing UT with this emit. The properties of the commonly used piezoelectric transducer as shown in the table below. Quartz, blah, blah, blah. Not that looking too much. <coughs> So, what do you look for? If As a transmitter, which material is the most efficient for generating electrical to mechanical conversion, PJT? As a receiver, lithium sulfate. Which material is the best total conversion energy? Conversion energy, PJT. Which material is the highest acoustic impedance, PJT? Which material is the lowest acoustic impedance, lithium sulfate? Which transducer will give the best transmission into water? Lithium sulfate, because it has the closest acoustic impedance to water. <coughs> Radiated fields of ultrasonic transducer. The sound that emanates from piezoelectric transducer doesn't originate from a point, but instead originate from most of the surface of the piezoelectric element. Round transducers are often referred to as piston source of transducer because of the sound field resembles a cylinder mass in front of the transducer. The sound field from a typical piezoelectric transducer is shown in below. The intensity of sound is indicated by color with light color indication, higher intensity. So there is a near field. There is a far field. So near field is front hopper and far field of <clears throat> the probes are constructed from there is a housing socket damping block crystal protecting protecting face uh, probe delay Electrical leads, connectors, 
the standard probe diameter varies from 5 to 25 in special cases two thread mem diameter probes are used and most application two to six megahertz probes are required for different application probes with smaller frequencies up to five megahertz and higher frequencies only for immersion wave we can go up to 25 megahertz immersion or automatic or zero compression probe <clears throat> a piezoelectric transducer made of thickness of region at uh, the required frequency and coated with silver on opposing surface faces to allow soldering or electrical wires to do it. A damping material bonded to the back face of the crystal to control the length of the pulse and also the, to attenuate the sound transmitted from the back to the crystal, back of the crystal, the own face on the front of the crystal, it may be hardware resistance material, a rubber membrane, or a replaceable material such as phosphex. This own faces also acts as a damping medium to shorten the pulse. The front wear layer should be one quarter of the wavelength of sound in the layer material. If the wear layer is made up of half wavelength thickness, uh, it would set up a second interfering resonance vibration. Coaxial connectors connect the UFD via coaxial cable uh, with the center wire or coaxial going to the back of the crystal. A case usually metallic which conducts electricity to and from the front face of the crystal. Delay line transducer. Single crystal probes have a dead zone. If a probe acts as both transmitter and receiver, the crystal will detect its ringing. As the crystal is excited and the vibration decays, the transducer will also send an electrical image of its ringing back to the flaw detector. This means that large peak will be seen on the UFD corresponding to the transmitted pulse. If the transmission pulse length is too long, there are excessive internal reflections. This resulting pulse will obscure receiving signal at short beam path. This can occur if the crystal rings for too long due to damping medium become detached from the crystal or if there are reverberation within the probe. Another source of spurious in the signals is due to radial oscillation from the side of the transducer. This collection of interference is generally known as dead zone and is influenced by the characteristic of both probe and UFD. Twin crystal probes are on one solution to dead zone problem by having separate transmitter and receiver crystals. The transmitter doesn't detect this ringing, but the TR probe presents special problems. Twin crystal probes, while similar to two crystal probes side by side, have several important differences. One crystal acts as a transmitter, one acts as a receiver, while this theoretically allows some probe designer to make optimum use of best transmitter and receiver material. This is not a common practice. As the transmitting and receiving crystals are separate, the probe shouldn't detect its ringing, but there are generally no dead zone. Multi-reflection within the delay path of the transmitter do not interfere because the transmitter element do not have any reception function. Only when the sound pulse come out of the test object, and into the receiver element of the TR probe do evaluate echoes appear on the display. There may, however, be some crosstalk. 
if the transmitter sends sound directly to the receiver due to breakdown of the acoustic barrier between them. The electrical and acoustical separation due to technical reason not completely possible, especially high grain adjustments and rough test subject surface cause portions of sound to be directly transferred from transmitter to the receiver. This generates an electric interference echo on the display, which is called crosstalk echo. The crosstalk echo can cover the near surface area of the test object. And once again, there is a loss of detection sensitivity, especially small discontinuities. However, most crosstalk echoes are so small or even negligible that they can clearly distinguish from possible discontinuities echoes. Crosstalk echoes are predominant at high grain. <clears throat> it increases with the surface roughness because more scattered waves from the surface reach the receiver. Tear probes are therefore ideally suited for detection of near to surface discontinuities and thickness measurement on thin, thin test objects. The tear probe reacts considerably less sensitive to coupling variation, which may be caused by rough or curved material surface. These characteristics explain why tear probes play a valuable part in the chemical and energy generating industries. They are ideal for testing all types of tubes, containers, for the detection of discontinuities in tube walls and for measurement of inside corrosion and remaining wall thickness. The transmission and transmitter and receiver crystals are tilted slightly so that the receiving crystal will receive the transmitted beam. This tilting will be discussed in more detail when we talk thickness measurement because the crystals are tilted, there will be a depth of optimum focus and the sensitivity will drop up rapidly at longer and shorter beam paths. Because of the beam travel at an angle, sound travel slightly further than the shortest distance from the probe, this may cause inaccurate in thickness measurement, particularly when measuring very thin crystal materials. <coughs> Twin crystal probes have a maximum sensitivity at their focal length. Sensitivity drops away from other beam path. Sensitivity of single crystal probes drop up at predictable rate. Another characteristic of twin crystal probes is that an extra reflection is often produced past the first back wall reflection when testing material of a certain thickness. First back wall, second back wall, a mystery collocated between the first and second back wall. The check mechanism of the extra reflection depend on the probe design and the thickness examined. The two possible mechanisms are the production of weak shear wave due to slight inclination of the compression wave. But this is the cause. Then the mystery echo should be either 1.4 or 1.8 times the first back wall, depending on whether the Shear wave is traversed the thickness in one or both direction. The value of 1.8 is the ratio of compression and shear value. The extra big wall occurs with the, within the perspex block. In this case, the mystery echo should appear at a distance behind the first back wall, equivalent to the time taken to do on one return journey in the perspex body, perspex block. Primary beam results in first back wall because weak shear wave generated, which converts to compression and arrives later due to lower velocity shear. Compression waves complete an extra traverse in the perspex block. The precise mechanism is not particularly important. In either case, when the probe is coupled, the echo always appeared following the first back wall and always be present for combination of probe thickness. It can be experienced reliably identified as a spurious echo, it is not a real reflector. <coughs> Depth resolution is improved using the short pulse length, which can be achieved by using short test possible pulse 
using the highest possible frequency as a rule of thumb the resolution of two reflectors such a different depths will be possible if their beam paths differ by at least half the pulse length <clears throat> the resolution of two reflectors at different depths will be possible if their beam beam paths differ by at least half the pulse length. <clears throat> So this is this is resolution. Resolution is differentiate like there are two equals A B, not same as here. Practical consequences of short pulse probe. Short pulse probe, the classification concept of pure wave motion become less certain and calculation near near zones. Beam spreads and wavelength are less accurate. This is relatively small piece, small price to pay for the better resolution. Manufacturers may have considerable trouble controlling the frequency of very short pulse length probes. It is possible to show the characteristics of the pulse produced by probe in either the time or frequency domain. Long pulse narrow bandwidth probes are much easier to produce. A close frequency tolerance, long pulse length probes favor poor resolution, but higher sensitivity than equivalent short pulse probes. Probe manufacturers often produce data sheets on their probes. We show the pulse shape and bandwidth in graphical form. So bandwidth, the range of frequencies, pulse shape and show the pulse length, the pulse spectrum, so the mix of frequencies in the damped pulse. The shorter the pulse, the broader the mix of frequencies frequencies, bandwidth, the range of frequencies, F2 minus F1. F1 is the lower frequency in the range and defined as the lower frequency where the amplitude is 70% amplitude of F4 and F2 is the upper frequency in the range. F2 minus F1. A short pulse with give a broad frequency band. In ultrasonic probes with maximum pulse length of five cycles preferred, a short pulse can be regarded as being produced by combining several different waves to synchronize the impure pulse, the less pure the pulse, the wider the range of frequencies will need it to synthesize it. This range of frequencies is referred to as bandwidth. And the shorter the pulse length, the greater the bandwidth. Conversely, a very long pulse approach, the shape of a continuous sine wave with one frequency and so the bandwidth is small. Ultrasonics, we talk about probes being in the range of long pulse, narrow bandwidth. These probes generate a long pulse over a very narrow range of concepts called high quality vectors. I think it is a pure gimbal ringing, short pulse to wide bandwidth, wide bandwidth. These probes generate a short pulse over a wide range of frequencies. Low Q thinks of, uh, think of it as a muffled gimbal ringing. 
the frequency domain and time domain view of the short and long pulse. So on below. So frequency spectrum pulse. The main advantage of twin crystal probe is greatly reduced dead zone. No dead zone really. Both pulse length and the frequency of the probe determine the resolution of a probe. Ensure the energy passes from the transmitter to receiver through the test object. Crystal in a twin probe is slightly thick. The probe detects its own ringing and discontinuities cannot be detected. In the dead zone. The probe is energized with continuous sound of various variable frequency. It is applied to test piece. There will be certain frequencies at which the test object will resonate. When the wavelength is multiple of half a wavelength. Resonance testing equipment operates in this principle and the operator listens from the resonant frequencies of the material. Then calculates the half wavelength of the lowest fundamental frequency. The half wavelength is the thickness. For example, if you are doing a resonance testing upon a compression wave, we found that fundamental frequency of stale specimen is 1.2 megahertz. <coughs> wavelength is 5900 divided by 1200. or 5.9 divided by 1.2. 4.92 mm, therefore thickness, that is lambda. Thickness is divided by 2, that is 2.46. This is the resonance thickness. So near and far fields. In the real world, sound waves propagate by Huygens principle. What is Huygens principle allows us to calculate pressure in the wavefront. Huygens principle tells us the plane waves can be regarded as being comprised of an infinite number of spherical waves as shown below, a plane wave generator comprising an infinite number of point generator, point wave generated by a combination of spherical waves. So there are point waves. From the point we have, this is the source, one, two, three, four, five, we consider maybe many points and all are combining to an infinite number of spherical waves. The pictures, a stone dropped into a pool of steel water, the resulting wave motion is 360 degree circular wave front. We were at the drop pay line of pebble into the pool. All at once, they will each generate a spherical wave. In this time, the spherical wave should merge to form a wave, plane wave. Huygens principle indicate that Write down at the atomic scale, each atom acts as a point generating a spherical wave. And the plane wave is the amalgamation of all the spherical waves to form one combined plane of piston type wave. This is fine if the surface is infinite but real. Transducer surface are finite size. This has two important results in ultrasonic. So for round crystals, near zone equal to d square by 4 lambda. And n for square crystal, 
equal n equal to 1.3 of d effective square divided by 4 lambda. So, near zone, I can calculate. I don't want to. You can see lambda, calculate and d square by 4 lambda, that's one. 5.9 divided by 2.5 equal to 2.4 mm. So calibrate 45 degree probe for range for 0 0.0 to 100. So set up to get a signal from very shallow 1.5 mm side drill hole. This is very shallow. And the next and the next. So if it is beyond your zone, Preferably no more than 3 mD as shown below. Get the maximum response from the scribe mark 1.5 mL. When very carefully move the probe slowly. Backward and forward. You should see the signal from the hole moving up and down as you move the probe. Demonstrating the highly variable sound pressure in the near zone. If they repeat the experiment with deeper hole, say 15 mm, the erratic screen height effect will not be evident as you are now beyond the near zone. The far zone is more predictable area beyond the near zone. We have determined that the near zone is an area of considerable sound wave interference resulting in an erratic sound. Beyond the near zone, the beam is shaped by further constructive interference from the crystallized. So for single crystals, we are mainly going for far zone, even for water. Immersion testing, far zone. But I think PAUT, you have to be inside near zone. Far zone. If you look at the figure, you will see that situation will arise where the spherical waves from opposite sides of the crystal will exactly have the wavelength out of phase and will cancel each other. This will definite, define the of beam, which will assume conical shape. It's called far zone, also known as the Fraunhofer zone. Near zone is fresnel zone. In the far zone, sound pressure is maximum at the center of the beam. So that's why you have a beam. Beam spread is calculated using a formula sine theta by 2 equal to k lambda by d. So that is, that is beam spread 
beam divergence really sin theta by 2. So if sin theta, well, 2 k d by, that is total beam spread. So sin theta by 2 equal to k lambda by d, k b by d f. <coughs> so k have different values, 50 percent of pressure at center of the beam 0.56, 10 percent of pressure at center of the beam 1.08, 32 percent of pressure at center of the beam 0 0.88, zero pressure extreme edge is 0 0.1.22. So there are values for different things. different positions really sir uh, so maximum we can calculate 1.2 uh, so 1.22 in practical purpose the age of the beam is generally defined as the point where the beam is pressure is 10 percent of the center line pressure k 1.08 others may define the age as Extreme is K 1.22. Be aware of both conventions may be used. So 1.22 into 3 by 20 lambda. If they have lambda, 20 mm, 2 megahertz. And in steel, so if they come, they take 6,000 meter per second and 6 by 2 is 3, that's why they take lambda as 3, and D is 20 mm diameter, so they get theta equal to 21, that is one side, other side, oh no, theta equal to 21, so total theta, that is the total theta, beam spread. <laughs> these are side lobes three are side lobes these are up to near field they can sometimes be source of irritation and they are using 70 degrees here wave props Large reflectors have reflected pressure inversely proportional to the beam path length. Screen height, distance. Bequel giving a screen height of 100%. FSH at the beam path is 50 mm. Would give a 50% FSH at 100 mm and 25 percent FSH at 200 mm. Comparison of inverse square and inverse distance relationship. Then you have connectors, you have Lemo, BNC, Bingley, Microdot, Subbis, UHF. Lemo. So these are Lemo connectors. May have many, four, five, anything it can be just push type. And there is a socket where uh, where you can just there is a red mark for each so that they are same place you can press it then there is bnc these are bayonet bayonet types used in many u.s manufacturers They are relatively simple and cheap, used for extensively audio and hi-fi. 
You can be bought in most audio subs. Bingley. Microdot. So there is micro. This is microdot male. Uh, you have microdot female connector also. Microdot and sub this UHF. Some immersion proofs. Uh, as they can be made of waterproof using an O-ring. So most manufacturers also supply adapters that allow their connector type to be connected to other types, LEMO and BNC. Any other supplier offering proofs with a certain connector type should be a supply connectors and connectors cables combination. So there is EMET, electromagnetic acoustic transducers. A number of practical EMET configurations are shown below in each the biased magnetical magnet structure, the coil and forces of surface solids are shown in exploded view. The first three configurations uh, will excite beams propagating normally to the surface of a half space and produce respectively beams with radial, longitudinal and transverse polarization the final two use separately wearing stresses to excite beams propagating to at oblique angle or along the surface of a component although a great number of variations in this configuration have been conceived and used in practice consideration of these three geometries should suffice to introduce fundamentals cross-sectional view of a spiral coil emit exciting radially polarized shear waves propagating normally to the surface Electromagnetic acoustic transducer cross section. So, cross section view of a longitudinal field emit for exciting polarized longitudinal waves. Polarized shear waves. And that is north and south pole, like this, and there is South North, North South, side by side. And we are putting coils. So this is producing the normal longitudinal wave and this is producing the shear wave. Practical image design are relatively narrowband, requires strong magnetic fields, large current to produce ultrasound that is often weaker than that are produced by piezoelectric transducer, rare earth materials such as samarium cobalt and neodymium iron boron are often used to produce sufficiently strong magnetic fields, which may also be generated by pulsed electromagnets. The EMAT offers many advantages based on this coupling tree operation. These advantages include the ability to operate in remote environment at elevated speeds and temperature to excite. Polarization is not easily excited by fluid coupled piezoelectric and produces highly consistent measurements. These advantages are tempered by low frequencies and careful electronic design and essential to applications. So these are the connections we you can we can see directly.
then trope classification contact transducer immersion transducer both groups are subdivided into single crystal transducer twin crystal transducer contact transducer are classified into compression wave shear wave angle beam twin crystal transducer are transmitted uh, classified into paired and stacked transducer okay we'll go for the next day thank you